Uh, my name is Luke. Uh, at Street Roots, I go by Luke Sensei. Um, right now, I'm trying to recover from homelessness and working with vocational rehab to try to figure out what my next career move will be. Um, I make a little income by selling Street Roots. I've been blessed with a grant from uh, Transition Projects in terms of housing, so I have my own apartment that they're funding for me right now. And just going through the steps of um, moving back into a more, uh, what's the word, uh, quote unquote normal world. Well, when I got to Portland, I had been working in San Diego as a manager of a, a hostel, and that, that hostel closed. And that was my place of uh, employment, and it wasn't much, uh, much income, and it was also where I was living at the time. And the reason I had moved to San Diego was to be near my children. My daughter went away to college, and my son and I had a great relationship, and he's, he was busy with high school. And I'd always wanted to live in the Pacific Northwest. So I bought a Greyhound ticket to, to Portland, and my first day here was the first day I ever slept on the streets. Uh, that first day, too, I got introduced to TPI, which is Transition Projects. Eventually got a case manager there and started going through the various hoops of trying to get my life back in gear. So um, I went from a three-bedroom house or apartment to um, a backpack, uh, literally. Uh, Port Portland is awesome. I mean, if you want to be homeless, Portland is the place to be. Uh, the people are just tremendous. I, mean, I just love the people here. I love, I love everything about living here. Um, Health care is really tough. I definitely need dental work. I can't get it. The only free dental work you can get is an extraction, and I have tons of cavities that need filling. I've had some medical issues, and that I couldn't get any care, really. Um, there was one point where I wound up in an emergency room and, uh, you know, I, I'm going to get billed for that. Cause, so basically, health care is really difficult. So the, for people like me, the only kind of health care is when you're sick enough to go to an emergency room. And then it's, you know, it's uh, peripheral. It's just very Band-Aid-like. Um, housing at first was an issue. So... Uh, so again, I spent a month out on the streets, then I got into the Portland Rescue Mission, and then uh, TPI, a uh, place called Doreen's Place, and now I have an apartment. What's amazing is that process took me less than a year, uh, whereas in San Diego, it would have probably been two or three years. Um, in terms of food, uh, there are so many free places to, to eat, and uh, so it, it's difficult to starve in Portland. Um, the same with like clothing. Uh, a lot of places will give you clothing, um, blankets, things like that. Um, there's a, there are a lot of homeless people in Portland, so there's not enough services to provide for everyone. But, but still, I, I, I'm not complaining. I'm happier than ever. My personal way of um, I, I'm not, I don't belong to any organized religion, but my personal value system has been shaped by Buddhism greatly. And there's the components of compassion, generosity, kindness. Uh, you know, like one thing difficult for homeless people is to find a place to sleep. And so often they'll be chased out by the police in the morning or it'll vary from where you can go. Uh, there's been rainy seasons where people are sleeping under a bridge and all of a sudden they've got to leave. Uh, so just the living space, and there's so many vacant lots. Uh, you know, so basically living space. Uh, with food, there are so many people who contribute, um, nonprofit organizations, Christian churches, um, so that, in that sense, it's wonderful. Um, what's often, I think, misunderstood with the homeless is they're categorized as one group, and it's, a, it's not a homogenous group. There are people who are homeless due to income loss. There are people who are homeless due to psychiatric disease. Uh, there are drug addicts, alcoholics. And so there's this whole slew of, it's, it's almost like 
many different cultures coming together, and I think that's often misunderstood by the general community. The homeless are grouped as this one you know, type of group. Um, and that's, that's a difficulty too because uh, I've seen more people flip out here doing crystal meth or heroin than I have anywhere else in the world. And so you've got this drug community intermingling with people like me who don't, you know, who aren't into that lifestyle. I mentioned I have an apartment. Uh, I, uh, in this apartment, I don't have a TV, I don't have Wi-Fi, so my main source of information is radio. And my, the station I mainly listen to is um, public radio, Oregon Public Radio over here. And what amazes me is actually how, how conscientious and concerned the, the city and the community is about the homeless. So more than any place I've ever lived, and partially I, I hadn't been homeless anywhere, but. Um, but I have been in shelters in San Diego. Um, people here are, are much more compassionate. So I, I think it's a difficult issue. I think they're doing a great job. I mean, you know, considering my only income is, uh, is from street roots, so I'm s standing out there and I don't, I don't push it, I don't ask people to buy it, I just stand out there. And you know, I, there are days where people give me 20 bucks, 10 bucks. You know? um, at that same corner where I'm at is somebody panhandling, and he'll get five, ten, you know, he'll get enough money for food or possibly shelter that evening. So, so there's this sort of tension between compassion, but also, you know, the homelessness are pain in the, in the rear end, so to speak. You know, they they litter a lot of them. They they get drunk. They uh, disrupt business. So in terms of uh, what we call Tent City, uh, the right to dream too, uh, there's been a discussion which I hear a lot about on OPR about where to move them. The owner of that property wants to sell it, they have to move, where do they go? So the city found a place in the Pearl District. And what you hear business owners say a lot is, you know, we want a place for them, but not here. Where can they go? So I, it's it's a difficult issue because on the one hand, previously being a business owner, I could see how a large homeless population would interfere with my my business, with um, my profits. Um, on the other hand, I would be compassionate to them. Uh, so so it's a difficult issue. But for the most part, I think uh, people in Portland are just tremendous. Uh, there was a point when I was uh, practicing, I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine, and I was practicing medicine in Chicago. And I'm driving with my friend uh, in his Lexus. Uh, I had done a home visit for which I was paid $600. And there was a man with a sign standing on the street. Uh, and I turned to my friend and I said, man, how does someone get that way? Well, I now know. Uh, so going through this experience, each person's story is unique on how, how they got there. You know, nobody plans to be homeless. It's not like you know, you're intending to, to be homeless one day. The more that information is out there, the more people who don't know what it's like can get a sense of it. Um, you know, again, I went from a three-bedroom apartment to living on the streets. How, how did I get that? Uh, the, the reality is it can happen to almost anybody. Um, so, so, I think a huge problem just in, in, in American society in particular is consumption consumption of material goods. Part of what Buddhism teaches is uh, unattachment. There's you know, so much we don't need. And you know, instead of, say, buying two cameras or three cameras you know, you know, to, to get this kind of picture, maybe take 10% of your money and give it to somebody who actually really needs it. You know? 
or uh, go volunteer somewhere. But we're all in this society together, so it's it, it's definitely made me more of a socialist. You know, I sometimes think of Star Trek, where there's no money and everything's available for everybody. Well, it's it's one world. Uh, if you're having a bad day and you're frustrated, you may drive a certain way and cause an accident. Uh, you may be disre disrespectful of your neighbor. Uh, when you throw your cigarette butt on the street, somebody's got to clean that. Uh, it's not biodegradable. It goes into the system. It stays there for years. And that's, you know, on a global scale, you know, if you're building, or, or better, better yet, the introduction of GMOs, genetically modified organisms, which in some cases I think would be a wonderful idea, but it's just done so thoughtlessly and it endangers everybody. Uh, it's a closed world. You can't block yourself off from someone else. You, you, it, it's, I, think, I think an illusion to think you could build a fence around yourself and say, okay, they're there and we're here. It doesn't work that way. Community. Community is a good word because it, it involves everybody living around you. you know? So uh, as an example, one thing I really like about Portland is there's a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, farmers markets and, and communal uh, economics. Um, and that just makes sense, you know, if, if I'm living in a neighborhood, I want Joe to prosper because if Joe prospers, I'm going to prosper. Uh, again, no one is, no man is an island. Uh, and so, so in a way, okay, so I live, say, in a certain part of Portland, I have my community. It, if I know my neighbors, chances are if somebody comes to break into my house, they'll say, hey, you know, who are you? What are you looking for? Um, that's simply because I know uh, Marianne or uh, Joe across the street and when I'm not home they look out for me and when they're not home I look out for them. Um, when I first moved into this apartment I did not have a telephone, I did not have Wi-Fi um, and I got sick. Well all of a sudden I had neighbors knocking on my door saying hey are you okay do you need anything? Uh, you know they got me some uh, whatever, coconut water, or, you know, some Gatorade, um, some Tylenol. They said, hey, if you need to make a phone call here, you know, if, if um, you need to get to the hospital, we'll, we'll gladly drive you. It's just, it's a win-win situation. So uh, one, one other caveat to that is, okay, so that's my little neighborhood, but where does that border end, you know? so. It doesn't end there. Does it end in Portland? Does it end in Cas Oregon? Does it go to Cascadia? Is it American? Is it North American? Is it? Yeah. It's it's one world. Well, as we were talking earlier, I mean, ideally, I'd love to play music professionally. Um, so, what are, the, what are the barriers right now for you to to get there? Well, I, I, one is poverty. Uh, so I, I have, a, for instance, the only phone I have right now is a cell phone, which is a SafeLink program, which they call Obama phones. So it's basically a free phone, but I'm limited to 250 minutes. The other day I was trying to renew my food stamps, and I literally used up 150 of those minutes. So I'm left with 100 minutes the rest of the month. Then somebody calls me because I want to... I'm, uh, trying to work with an employment agency. I'm also contacting various colleges in the area to get to talk to deans. I used to be a professor. Um, so I'm looking into getting credentialed um, in acupuncture here in Oregon. Um, but with a hundred minutes left, you know, it's gone within a day or two. And, and then what do you do? Where do you go to use a phone? You know, uh, that's one barrier. Uh, transportation would be a huge one, except that because I, I'm fortunate to be working with the Department of Human Services, they provide a bus pass. But if they didn't, I'd somehow have to come up with that money. Um, Wi-Fi. I don't have Wi-Fi. And that's a huge impediment to getting employment. So for instance, I could go to the library and be on their computer for an hour. What if it takes me half an hour to do one application, and then I start doing another application, and boom, you're out of time. Um, 
then they want a, <clears throat> a telephone number they could call you back at. Well, it took me about six months to get a phone. So we're, how can I get a job if I don't have a phone or email, you know? Uh, <clears throat> transportation. A huge thing in Portland is when I first got here, I had a huge backpack. There's nowhere to store that. How do you go to an interview? You know, you can get a shower. You can possibly get clothing for interviews. But if you're living on the street, where do you iron that clothing? You know, where do you, where do you put your backpack? You, you know, you walk into the office and you're carrying a 100, or sorry, 80 pound backpack. You know, so that's one huge, if, if I won the lotto tomorrow, that's one thing I'd do immediately is open up a place where people could just store belongings for a day or you know, whatever. So, I mean, there's a ton of minor issues. You know, you're sleeping on the street, where do you go pee? You know, there are two public restrooms in this area. I mean, uh, public, I mean, uh, what do you call them? Outdoor latrine kind of places. Uh, you know, so you're facing being arrested, <laughs> but where do you go, you know? Um, you know, and, and the, I mean, the other reality is when you're on the streets, you're a subject of the weather. So again, how do you get a job if it's been raining, you know, you're completely soaked, you've got, it's, you, you get the TPI and all, all of, uh, it's a place where you can shower, um, and all the shower slots are filled. You got to get there. You know, again, fortunately, I, I had I had the good fortune of getting good case managers, so that was provided. But that's not always the case. So it's like, okay, get a job. Well, you know, think of all the things you know necessary to get a job. You know, what's your address? I don't have one. My address is Second and Burnside or something. Uh, well, what's your phone number? I don't have one. Well, how? How can an employer even get in contact with you? So for me, uh, I've moved to a lot of the hoops that you have to go through. And each of these steps requires all kinds of hoops. Um, but I consider myself fairly intelligent, and uh, not, not everyone is. I'm very well educated, not everyone is. Um, I'm motivated, not everyone is. I mean, if you've been homeless for a few years, you wind up getting pretty depressed. Most, well, a lot of people do. So, I'm not sure if I'm completely answering your question, but... No, you are. You, yeah, you're just telling me your perspective, and then, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, even, even simple things like a haircut, you know. Um, or now, I, I live in a... I'm fortunate to have an apartment, but I really have no income. Um, so again, I, I, I don't have Wi-Fi in my house. Little things like dishwashing soap, toilet paper, um, disinfectant. Uh, there, I believe there's mold in the apartment. You know, if I'm making sometimes eight dollars a day, twelve dollars a day, how do you do that? Or right now, I'm in a situation where I went to renew my food stamps. They ended. I tried to re. Uh, I filled out the application, they call me, I, I'm unable to answer the phone, I run out of minutes. Um, luckily for me, I work at Street Loop, so there I was able to use their phone. But I eventually had to go to their office and, and get it done. So there I'm told, okay, you'll have your food stamps on October 1st. And everything's completed, and I go to use my food stamps, and there's no money there. So again, I have to go back to the office. And it's like, oh no, it's got to be processed. It'll take you know three to five days or whatever, seven days. We don't really know. Okay, well, thank you. You know, thanks for misinforming me. Thanks for the six hours I spent trying to get this. You know, which, which should be a uh, street boots to me is a triple win situation. Um, when I first got to Portland and was living on the streets and uh, had no income whatsoever. Um, I'm meaning no food stamps, no, no income, zero dollars. Um, I went to Street Roots and started selling papers and you know, at first there were days I'd make, make five or ten dollars, but that five or ten dollars was precious. Um, for me, and this is a personal issue, I 
don't like, I've never panhandled. So for me, it gave me an opportunity to work, a certain dignity. I'm not out there asking for money, I'm selling a quality paper. That's an important issue because a lot of people who buy Street Roots buy it for the quality. And Street Roots has won awards for uh, journalistic excellence. That's amazing. The reason it was put out was for exactly that, to provide some income opportunity with dignity for the homeless. Um, the people there, to me, have been wonderful. Um, I could, at first, again, I would go there. It was a place where I could have a cup of coffee. It was one of the few places I could sit for half an hour and check my email. Um, when you know, There's one phone you can use. Sometimes you have to wait a while, but you can make a phone call. Um, occasionally, people donate clothing items or hygiene products or things like that. Uh, occasionally, people will bring in a pizza or something like that. Uh, but it also gave me a sense of camaraderie. So, for instance, the, uh, the uh, primary uh, editor at Street Roots, um, Israel, he's been there himself. Uh, and then he was a vendor himself. And so now he's running the paper and he has an understanding of it. So, so the organization, it allows for people to publish socially pertinent material and stories that aren't written in any other paper. It, allow, it gives the uh, community information that they might not otherwise get. And I, often people come up to me and say, hey, this is the best paper in Portland. And it allows people like me to have hope. With, with, again, with, with dignity. What, what I would love is for everybody out there to... Uh, sometimes I, I drive by these houses or, you know, the bus passes these houses where a single family is living in this mansion. You know, they've got t two or three cars. And, and then I compare it to where I'm at and my needs. And, what I would wish is that each of these people could spend a week or two on the streets. And by then I mean, grab a backpack, fit everything you can carry and you think you'll need, and then leave. Leave your keys, leave your credit card, leave your telephone, go to a different city where you know nobody. If I could color that a little bit. What I'm saying is, uh, and this isn't just with the homeless, this is again for me a Buddhist concept, but. The word compassion means with suffering. Um, and that's basically, with has to do with, with suffering, but also with other people's suffering. You have a compassion. Um, we, we tend to jump to conclusions based on our, you know, somebody hits us on the street, or, you know, we have a, a little bumper, uh, what do you call it, a bumper fender, a fender bumper. Uh, a fender bender. Fender bender, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and we get mad and it's like, you know, what the hell are you doing? Well, you don't know what happened. You know, maybe the guy's brakes messed up. Maybe he was distracted by something. Um, you know, you can react to that situation by going, you know, what the hell did you just do? Or you can come out and say, hey, are you okay? You know, we make assumptions about the way people act and so on without knowing their situation. You know, somebody's rude on the street, uh, well, you know, maybe they just lost a dear one. I mean, the streets make it very real. Um, you don't know what that person's going to. You don't know what just happened to them. You know? and on the streets, they may have just lost somebody. I mean, that's a, a real case. Um, that happened to, to, to somebody that we knew. Um, you don't know, they, you know. So the thought is basically to not make assumptions about how other, others, why others act the way they do, um, and to have compassion for them. You know, place yourself in their shoes. What if this happened to me? You know? And the work you're doing is exactly, I think, what's necessary. There's, just a lack of information for people who have never been homeless on what it's like to be homeless. And that was certainly true for me back in the day. I mean, 
I, I'd be the same person going, you know, why should I give them some money? You know, I, I work hard for my money. Well, my perspective has changed dramatically on that. I, I should help them out because they're my brother. They're a fellow human being. We're all in this together. I don't know if that... Yeah. Yeah, just that. Just It's one world, you know. Things like compassion, human kindness, unattachment. I used to have 3,000 books, three, 4,000 books. Um, I loved those books. Now I, there was a point where I had none. I literally went from you know, a decent lifestyle um, to living with a backpack on. And quite honestly, there were points when I was happiest with just that backpack. Um, it's a deeper living. Like if you think of uh, the Buddha or even Jesus Christ, they were homeless. They were ascetics. You know? The world was their world. Um, they ate because of the kindness of others. And it's amazing too, the stories, that I, I could tell you stories and stories of kindness from homeless people. You know? They have two pairs of socks, somebody needs a pair of socks, they give them that pair of socks. Um, you know, whatever, you have a sleeping bag and a blanket and uh, somebody doesn't, they give it to them. They'll, I tell you, you know, they'll take you, they'll go with you to a hospital if you need help. You know. it's, it's a completely different way of living. All the things that seem important in, in like the business world and the, the modern society aren't. You know, you know, the idea of simplification. You know, what do we really need? So for me, I, I mean, one real benefit of homelessness is it gives you a lot of time. You, you, you have nothing to do. And you think, and you watch, and you observe, and you share. And it makes life very real and very precious. Life is brief. You know. All these material goods that I used to think I needed, I, I don't need them anymore. In terms of equity, you know, there are needs and then there are wants and then there's uh, basically gluttony. Uh, and people get lost. They get lost in their own little worlds, their TV set, their, their, their particular society, their corporate world. You know, it's, it seems to miss the point of life. Life is much more precious.